Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 42 of the left side of the aisle. This is for the week of February 2nd through 8th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me and that I think deserve to be important to you as well. Uh, as always, if you have any reactions to the show, feel free to contact me. I can be contacted directly. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, uh, my uh, website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed around here somewhere uh, a couple of times during the show, and you can get the... Uh, email address from there. As always, I'll ask that if you do send me email, uh, if you would include in the subject line something like, you know, your show or left side of the aisle or something so I know it's not spam. So I have a couple things to get through today. Uh, the first one is that I'm actually going to start with some good news, which I meant to include last week, but I forgot. So I'll include it here. On January 20th, Massachusetts officially became the 16th state in the nation to um, officially recognize transgender citizens as a protected class under civil rights laws. This means they're now legally protected against discrimination in housing, education, and hiring, uh, and employment and credit, um, and there's also some protections about hate crimes. Now, some of the um, activists on the issue were a little disappointed because the bills, it avoided the touchy question of public accommodations like bathrooms, but um, still it is a real step forward. Now, um, I'm going to mention something else in relation to this, uh, not because it's important, but in order to make a point. I got an email several weeks ago, just a, a quick couple of sentence email, when I had mentioned something about same-sex marriage. I think it was in New York. And uh, the person just said, like, thank you for this, blah. And, but something in the, uh, what they said, because when I talk about this, I always talk about we're winning on this one. We're making progress on this one. Um, and something in their email made it clear that they thought I was gay. Well, you know, I'm not, um, which I mention again, not because it makes any difference in the show, because it doesn't, but just to make a point. When I say we, I mean all we people who are interested in justice, all we people are interested in human rights, all we people are interested in progress and social progress and in decency and in decent treatment. Um, it is an unfortunate necessity that occasionally we need to remind ourselves that you don't have to be, for example, black or Latino to care about civil rights for minorities. You don't have to be a woman to care about equal rights for women. And you don't have to be gay or lesbian to care about equal rights for the LGBT community. We are in this together and we all deserve justice, all of us. Um, okay, moving on from there. Uh, there's a question that I need to ask because I think it's something we need as Americans to ask ourselves. Are we, in any true sense of the term, are we still something that could be called a free nation? Now, I don't mean a nation where we think we're free or a nation in which we're free so long as we don't make a fuss because that's something that can be said by pretty much any oppressor down through history to most, if not all, of their population. You don't make a fuss, you're fine. Uh, and I don't mean a, peop a, a, a nation in which we think that we are free to dissent without fear of retribution, or a nation that we think we know it's being done in our names, or that we think that we're the final say on matters, but rather a nation in which we actually are free to dissent without fear, that we really do know what's being done in our names, and we really are the final say. Based in those terms, are we still a free nation? Just over a week ago, uh, a, a noted blogger and uh, actually a uh, former constitutional lawyer, named Glenn Greenwald, uh, he wrote about developments in three court cases, all of which occurred on one day, January 23rd, as an example of how the system works. The first case was one I mentioned last week. It was the case of former CIA agent John Kiriakou, who was um, charged with four felonies, two of them under the 1917 Espionage Act, for disclosing classified information, supposedly, allegedly, disclosing this information to journalists and investigators about the CIA's use of torture. 
Uh, this is the sixth prosecution under the Obama administration for whistleblowers. There were three in the preceding 91 years. Now, on that same day, June 23rd, a three-judge panel at an appeals court, a federal appeals court in Virginia, uh, upheld the dismissal of a lawsuit by Jose Padilla. Now, he's somebody else I've mentioned before. He's an American citizen who was arrested in Chicago on a charge of terrorism. Uh, so he's a U.S. citizen taken on U.S. soil. But despite that, he was held in military custody for three years without charge and without access to a lawyer and subjected to conditions such that they caused possibly permanent mental impairment. Now, a suit was filed on his behalf against uh, George Bush's Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, alleging that Rumsfeld was the one who signed off on Padilla's illegal arrest and torture. Well, the Obama Department of Justice defended Rumsfeld, arguing that an American citizen has no right to sue a government official for any treatment that they receive while they were an enemy combatant, even if that treatment is torture and prolonged illegal detention. And the courts have agreed. Every victim of our great war on terror, every victim has been denied access to the courts. Literally every single one. Now, I don't mean their cases were heard and they lost. I mean their cases weren't even heard. They couldn't even get into court to have their claims heard. The cases, without exception, have been dismissed based on government claims of immunity or secrecy. Now, the United Kingdom has actually reached settlements with people who were improperly imprisoned at Gitmo. Australia has done the same. But here in the U.S., the land of the free and the home of the brave, victims cannot even get into court to have their claims heard, even if, as in the case of Jose Padilla, they are American citizens, even if uh, as in the case of Maher Arar, that's A-R-A-R, -A -R, look it up. In the case of Maher Arar, everyone in agreed that he's innocent. All right, finally, on January 23rd, the third case uh, was actually the, the conclusion of, of cases involving a 2005 incident in Haditha in uh, Iraq where American Marines shot and killed 24 unarmed Iraqi civilians. One Marine was acquitted of these charges. Six others had their cases dropped, which only left Staff Sergeant Frank Wooderich. He was the guy in charge that day, and he told his soldiers to shoot first and ask questions later. His charges were reduced from first-degree murder to manslaughter to, in a plea bargain, dereliction of duty, with a maximum time in prison of 90 days, and he was sentenced to none. His only crime his only punishment, rather, for overseeing 24 counts of murder was a reduction in rank and some loss of pay. Based on these cases, Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald notes that the rules of American justice are pretty clear. If you're a high-ranking government official who commits war crimes, you will receive full immunity, and in fact, the president will demand that we look forward, not backward. If you're a low-ranking member of the military, you'll receive a token punishment, a relatively trivial punishment, for the purpose of protecting higher-ups further up the chain while still maintaining an aura of accountability. If you're a victim of American war crimes, you're a non-person who can't even get into court to have your claims heard. And if you talk publicly about these war crimes, you are charged with espionage. Greenwald said, I'm quoting him here, it's hard to imagine how it can get much more degraded and corrupted than that. How can we stand in the court of world opinion and continue to insist that we are a free nation, indeed the nation whose practices all other nations of the world should aspire to? Now, Jonathan Turley, he is the Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law at George Washington University. He's also a noted First Amendment expert. He asked much the same question I just did in a Washington Post op-ed about two weeks ago. I'm quoting him here. In the decades since September 11, 2001, this country has comprehensively reduced civil liberties in the name of an expanded security state. At what point does the reduction of individual rights in our country change how we define ourselves? He then proceeds to tick off a list of particulars. Presidents Bush 
and Obama have both claimed that the president can order the murder of anyone, including an American citizen, which he, in his sole unchallengeable authority, decides is uh, associated with or allied with terrorists. One U.S. citizen, Anwar al-Awlaki, has already been killed under this order. Uh, another one has been targeted. When other nations do that, we call them extrajudicial killings, and we condemn them. Under the National Defense Authorization Act, just signed this past December 31st, the president has the power to detain anyone, including U.S. citizens, in military custody indefinitely and without charge. When other nations do that, we call it disappearing them, and again, we condemn it. If there is a charge in one, of the, one such case, if there is a trial, the president now decides whether or not that will be before a federal court or a military tribunal, a system which has so few checks uh, and so few protections of basic due process that we condemn them when other nations use them. The president may now order warrantless surveillance, including, uh, including forcing companies and organizations to turn over information on citizens, on their finance, on their communications, on their associations. These can cover everything from financial records to your library records. Government can use national security letters, something else I've talked about before. They can use these letters to demand, without the need for a warrant, without probable cause, demand that organizations turn over information on citizens and then order those organizations to never reveal they even got this national security letter in the first place. Put it more simply, when the words terrorism or national security are invoked, the Fourth Amendment ceases to exist. The government now routinely uses secret evidence, evidence the accused is not allowed to see, to detain individuals um, and employ secret evidence in tribunals and in federal courts. Cases against the government are routinely dismissed based on nothing more than the unproven claim of the government that pursuing the matter will affect national security. And even the legal opinions that the government uses to justify its stands are themselves classified. As Turley says, this allows the government, quoting him again, this allows the government to claim secret legal arguments to support secret proceedings using secret evidence. Agents of the CIA and other government agents who committed or participated in war crimes, such as torture, were given blanket immunity not only against prosecution, but even against investigation. That gutted not only our treaty obligations, it actually guts the Nuremberg Principles that says you are responsible for what you do. There's been increased use of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. This is a secret court that considers secret evidence to issue secret warrants for secret searches. Warrants whose reach has been expanded to include even people who are not part of any terrorist group. The administration has asserted a right to ignore any congressional attempts to limit this sort of surveillance. The corporations that assisted in what was then the uh, illegal warrantless surveillance of civilians have been immunized against lawsuits. The Obama administration has successfully argued that it can use GPS devices to monitor every move of targeted people without a court order, without court, court oversight, without court review. That is, they can track anyone they want, anywhere, anytime, for any reason, and nobody, not even the Supreme Court, can say boo. The government could transfer both citizens and non-citizens to other countries under procedure known as extraordinary, uh, as extraordinary rendition, including sending them to countries where they can be tortured. Now, uh, President Obama, or President Hopi Changi as I call him, um, insists he isn't doing that, but also insists he absolutely has the right to if he wants to. Jonathan Turley says, new, the new laws have come with an infusion of money into an expanded security system, uh, more public surveillance cameras, tens of thousands of security personnel, and a growing terrorist-chasing bureaucracy. And the thing is, even Turley's list, even Greenwald's cases, they focus on national security issues. And at that, neither one of them mentions the attack on WikiLeaks or Bradley Manning. But they, the thing is, they concentrate on... Um, on the national security issues. 
which means they don't touch on the continuing evisceration of Fourth Amendment protections and the related expansion of the powers of local police. They don't touch on the continued militarization of those same police forces. They don't touch on the restrictions on free speech by so-called free speech zones and now frozen zones is the new term. They don't touch the continued legal elevation of corporate personhood. They don't approach the attacks on privacy. They don't approach a great deal more. Turley says, and I'm quoting here, an authoritarian nation is defined not just by the use of authoritarian powers, but by the ability to use them. If a president could take away your freedom or your life on his own authority, all rights become little more than a discretionary grant subject to executive will. Because as I have said many times, many times previously, it is insanely bad public policy to give government or government agents to give anyone power under the assumption it will never be abused. Professor Turley writes that whether we call ourselves a free nation with authoritarian inclinations or an authoritarian nation with free inclinations really makes little difference. It's really just sem semantics, and he's right. What it does mean, though, is that we are not who we like to think we are. So the real question is not just how authoritarian we are or, or have become. Rather, it's what I asked earlier. How can we stand in the court of world opinion? How can we dare to stand before the world? How can we, as we kill our own citizens without trial, as we imprison without charge, as we torture, search, and spy with impunity, as we violate our own rules and ignore our own laws, as we increasingly insist that the citizens of this nation do not have rights, but mere privileges granted by our betters? How can we, in our arrogance and our conceit, how can we continue to stand before the world and claim that we are a free nation? Indeed, that we are a free nation that others should look to emulate and a nation which is fit to judge them. When Barack Obama announced that the claim that he had power to uh, order the extrajudicial murder of an American, I posted on my blog the text of a letter I sent to the White House in which I asked, Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? Well, that could be asked of us as a nation. Just who the hell do we think we are? Because one thing is for certain, we're not who we like to think we are. And I'll be back with a footnote to this in about 10 seconds. We're gonna take a quick break. And here we are again. And as I said, I got a, a footnote to all of that that I just, that I just noted. Um, this actually is uh, going to be the first instance of an occasional feature, uh, Everything You Need to Know. Uh, this will be, again, uh, used for those occasional moments, occasional revealing moments when uh, you can understand a lot about something in just a sentence or two, and usually unintentionally, but okay, in this case, it's Everything You Need to Know in two sentences. Every year, the internationally respected organization Reporters Without Borders uh, releases its ranking of nations of the world in the order of the degree of press freedom found in those nations. In the rankings just released for the year 20, uh, 2011, the United States dropped 27 places from 20th to 47th, tied with Argentina and Romania and just behind Comoros and Taiwan. And that is everything you need to know. All right, so now we're going on to another, uh, our another regular feature, uh, the outrage of the week. The outrage of the week. This actually dates from a couple of weeks ago, but still. Um, it was a couple of weeks ago that the Supreme Court decided, issued its decision in the case of CompuCredit v. Greenwood. This had to do with the enforceability of uh, certain provisions and contracts. And the court ruled that the contract is binding, which it usually does, except under unusual circumstances, which is not at all surprising, and it's not unreasonable as a general principle of law. The thing is, in this case, the circumstances were anything but usual. This was a class action suit against CompuCredit and other credit providers. It was, uh, it was undertaken by, uh, on behalf of people who were suckered in 
Um, this, what these outfits did is they suckered in com uh, uh, consumers who had low or weak credit scores with ads promising to rebuild your credit, improve your credit rating. The promotional materials promised the people who signed up a $300 credit line, except that they found that in the first year they were hit with $257 in fees, plus any interest accrued if the fees were not paid immediately which basically means that many people who fell for this line wound up essentially paying the company $300 for nothing. Now, consumers, again, this was a class action suit, which means it's filed on behalf of all others similarly situated. Uh, that is, all folks affected by this, what I consider a scam. Uh, this suit was filed under the Federal Credit Repair Organization Act and California's unfair competition law. CompuCredit, in its defense, pointed to a provision in the contract consumers signed which said disputes would be dealt with on an individual basis through binding arbitration. And they moved to dissolve the class action and force each of these consumers to deal with the company one-on-one. -on -one. By a margin of eight to one, the Supreme Court agreed with CompuCredit. Now it's bad enough that the court found it fair, reasonable, and just to put single individuals of limited financial means and therefore limited access to, to legal assistance, and yes, by definition of limited means, because if you weren't of limited means, you wouldn't have signed up for this in the first place. Uh, they found it fair and just to pit single individuals without assistance against a large corporation. And that's not even accounting for the undoubtedly large number of people who either couldn't or wouldn't go to, um, uh, uh, go to uh, arbitration. And some of those who didn't, maybe because, you see these arbitration hearings are held with an arbiter basically chosen by the company at a place convenient for the company. Maybe you can't get to the hearing. Uh, maybe that uh, you're, you, you know that you, there, there can be fees associated with these hearings and sometimes the fees you have to pay to get an arbitration hearing are greater than the award. Or maybe they just know how small their chances are. Arbiters, who again are usually chosen by the company, rule against consumers 94 to 96 percent of the time. But even that is not the real outrage here. No, no, no. The Credit Repair Organization Act requires outfits like CompuCredit to inform its customers, I'm quoting here, you have a right to sue a credit repair organization that violates the Credit Repair Organization Act, quote, unquote. Now the court ruled, see if you can follow this, the court ruled that this act is silent on whether or not uh, claims under the act may be arbitrated. So because it's silent on this matter, the Federal Arbitration Act, which requires the arbitration to be enforced, is the one that has to be followed. In other words, the court ruled that as long as there is some way to hypothetically enforce the law, such as through binding arbitration, the law isn't violated. So in practice, the court declared that the Credit Repair Organization Act created for, cons uh, created for consumers, that this act created for consumers a right to be told that you have a right to sue, but did not create a right to sue. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said in her solitary dissent that the majority has in effect decided that Congress intended outfits like CompuCredits to be able to deceive consumers by telling them they had a right they didn't have. The length to which the Supreme Court, including particularly this Supreme Court, including, I will note, uh, Obama's uh, nominees, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor, the lengths to which this court will go to protect and advance corporate interest against the uh, interest of ordinary citizens is really truly outrageous. It is, in fact, the outrage of the week. And we're going to end up by trying to lighten things up a little bit here and another thing. And another thing, this is, uh, again, our occasional foray into things not explicitly political, just to try to lighten things up here. February 2nd is Groundhog Day, or by the time you see this, was Groundhog Day. Um, in older traditions, it was known as Candlemas. Uh, that's drawn from the Western Christian tradition of priests blessing candles to be used in church for the year, and some of those candles are distributed to parishioners. But uh, we know it as Groundhog Day. Uh, 
This is the day the groundhog comes out of its burrow to see if it sees its shadow. And if it sees one, it runs back into its burrow and there's another six weeks of winter. And if it doesn't see one, well, then it's going to stay out and there's an early spring. Where did that come from? You know, old cultures had Candlemas sayings. Uh, things like, you should still have half your hay on Candlemas. Other, you know, weather and advice things for farmers. But the tradition of Groundhog Day, using the groundhog in particular as the prognosticator, draws on that ancient folklore, but it took its modern form, in this, uh, modern American form, in the 1700s among German immigrants into Pennsylvania, the folks that are mistakenly called the Pennsylvania Dutch. But again, what, so what's the logic of this? I mean, groundhog telling the weather, what's the logic of this? The thing is, most old traditions are actually based on some kind of observational evidence. So what is the observational evidence that could connect the weather on February 2nd to the arrival of spring? Well, the first thing to note is that a thousand years ago, under the old Julian calendar, and you may remember I talked about that a couple of weeks ago, about why January 1st is the first day of the year. Under the old Julian calendar, the vernal equinox, the arrival of spring, occurred right around March 16th, which is exactly six weeks from February 2nd. Okay, that, that has about these six more weeks of winter bit, but what about the early arrival of spring? What, what, is, that? what is that? Well, it has to do with physics. You see, cold air can hold less moisture than warmer air. Uh, because, so it's harder to form clouds in cold air because there's less water vapor to do it. So if the air is a little warmer, a little wetter, it's easier to form clouds. So the thing is, the groundhog is more likely to see its shadow on a cold, dry day than on a warm, moist day. And so the idea is that if it's still, if it's cold and dry, well, then winter's still got a good grip. But if it's a little milder, a little warmer, a few more clouds, that, hey, maybe winter's grip is loosening and maybe things will ease up sooner. That's the idea. Okay, the last thing. How good is it? Two long-term studies of predictions by various groundhogs, and I love the fact that two different organizations did long-term studies of Groundhog Day predictions. But uh, these two studies determined that the predictions are accurate 37 to 39% of the time. So you'd actually be more likely to be right if you took the opposite of what the groundhog said. In fact, you'd be right almost two times out of three. All right, so that's and another thing for the day. And uh, we're going to wrap up right there. Um, how much time do I have left? Just uh, about one minute. All right, enough, just enough to say um, that uh, we'll see you next week. You have the greatest week you possibly can. We've got more good stuff for you then, but um, you hang in there. Don't forget, um, this is Women Heart Month, so don't forget that either.